What's up Mzanzi? Welcome to Farmers Inside Track episode 390. I'm your host Octavia Spandu. Are you a South African farmer looking to get the most out of your pastures? Have you ever heard about high intensity grazing but aren't sure if it's right for you? In this episode, Roland Kruen, Managing Director of Healing Wolf, dives deep into the world of high intensity grazing, a revolutionary approach to pasture management and can boost your soil health, increase your livestock's productivity, and even save your money. Roland, welcome to Farmers Inside Track. We are quite excited to have you with us today, specifically on the topic of high intensity grazing and just your expertise with us. What specific grazing management techniques are employed within high intensity grazing systems, such as mob grazing or strip grazing? Thanks, Octavia. It's very nice to be on this podcast. On that question of yours, I need to just maybe set a bit of framework around that. I focus and my speciality is in holistic management, which deals with enormous complexity in nature. And it moves specifically away from anything called a system. And throughout this discussion, we'll be talking more about the elements of grazing rather than ultra-density grazing system. And I'll explain that in a minute. So at the moment, we have in this grazing fraternity, we have all sorts of words being thrown around. We've got regenerative grazing, ultra-density grazing, mob grazing, total grazing, holistic planned grazing, multi-paddock adaptive grazing, and they all seem to be used interchangeably, which is in fact not correct. So when we're talking about ultra density, mob grazing, intensity, intensive grazing, like you're speaking about now, those are all systems and they actually are designed to fail because simply because we are imposing a system on nature, which is, and nature is infinitely complex, it's self-organizing, and it's therefore a fluid environment. So the moment we impose a rigid system on a fluid environment, we are going to bump our heads somewhere along the line. So I just want to set that as a sort of framework. In terms of what holistic plant grazing is, that is a much different approach because it's a decision-making process which essentially enables us to harness complexity of nature. In fact, if you look at a grazing system, if one grazing plan is the same from this year to next year, then it's in a system and it's designed to fail. So one has to just be a little bit careful when we're looking at nature that we can't just look at a rigid environment because everything changes. I mean, the weather conditions on the 10th of April or from this year to last year The only thing that is the same is the daily. So we need to just make sure that we're talking about this and the listeners tune themselves into the fact that we're dealing with something that is so volatile and so actually quite fragile. So the moment we start imposing things on nature, we're going to bump our heads in the long run. So, But having said that now, intensity of grazing or animal impact is one of the components of grazing. So we know that animal impact is a simulate the big herds of game in terms of cycling carbon and this sort of thing. So essentially, the grazing management techniques when we're looking at animal impact of high intensity is to concentrate the animals for a short period of time on a piece of land in order to do two things. Firstly, to graze the old moribund grass down, the old grass which otherwise would be oxidized or burnt, graze it down or trample it and incorporate it into the soil. And then secondly, using the animal's hooves and their dung and their urine to concentrate that energy on a piece of land to improve the organic matter in the soil and therefore improve the water holding capacity as we go along. And how does stocking rates and stocking densities play a role in high intensity grazing and how are they determined for optimal results? So again, and excuse me for sort of departing from the question and, and coming in with as a sidewinder, if we look at the two things that you mentioned there, you've got grazing and you've got animal impact because what we're doing is we're actually combining two concepts which are very different. Grazing is what animals do to feed themselves. Animal impact is what we as humans do to change animal behavior in order to break a cycle of non-disturbance in our environment. So the essential part about stocking rates and densities is that stocking rate is making sure that you have enough grazing for your animals and on the other side, enough animals for your grazing. Because sometimes, and in many, many places across Africa, and the world, we have cases where we, in fact, the stocking rates are way, way down and you have this mass of overrested or moribund material, which is of no value at all because it can only burn. Once it goes to a lignified state, it can only burn or be trampled. The animals can't utilize it. So we have to make sure that when we deal with stocking rates, stocking rates is about how much food there is available for the animals. Stock densities is a different thing entirely because stock density is when we're using 
a concentration of animals, let's say animal numbers per unit of land, let's say 200 livestock units per hectare. Once you get that stock density, that's when you start getting animals changing their behavior. They start concentrating their energy. They start dunging more regularly, start urinating. And because they bunch together, you have a quantum change on the landscape. So again, just to reiterate, just make sure that we separate this idea of stocking rates. Because stocking rates, you can push the stocking density as high as you want. If there's no food for the animals, they'll die. So stocking rates is matching how much grazing you have for your animals. Stock density is getting them bunched together to change the behavior so that they can start influencing the land. I know you've mentioned specifically about like cutting the specific dogger on grazing systems. Can you discuss the role of rest and recovery periods in high-intensity grazing systems or methods and how they can contribute to sustainable land use? So again, this is quite a fun part of it because let's just look at what rest and recovery periods mean and, and why they're actually of, of any relevance. And in order to do that, let's go all the way back to overgrazing. And the concept of overgrazing has always been understood as being too many animals. But in fact, it has absolutely nothing to do with animal numbers. It has everything to do with time control. So what recovery periods do we need? Well, we know that for plant health to be maintained, they must be optimally grazed. In other words, they need adequate recovery to restore their root systems. So we work on a tool called matching recovery period to the growth spread of the plant. So in any environment, whether it's a very high rainfall place like in the KZN or in uh, the Karoo, you get some rain, depending on the climatic conditions at the time, plant growth rates will vary. So they will vary tremendously. They will vary from, for example, up in the KZN area, you could have a required recovery period of 15 to 20 days. Whereas in the low rainfall areas, you could have a recovery period of up to 90 days. So what we try to do with this rest and recovery period is make sure that, that we give our plants adequate recovery for them to replenish their root reserves. So that's why I can't say to you it's 60, 90 days, whatever it be. The simple principle is make sure that you, your plants are adequately recovered before they graze for the second time. So that leads us to another element on this high density methodology is that by definition with high density, you're getting lots of animals for a short period of time, you're getting a severe graze. Now, a severe graze is very different to an overgraze. A severe graze is where you graze a plant from the level it is when the animals start right down to the base level. And then obviously, because that is a severe graze, the plant has to take longer to recover. If, however, you are not severe grazing, but you bring the animals in for a very short period of time and they're kind of just topping the grass, just skimming it, and they're moving off before they've taken the grass or the grazing down to base level, you need a much shorter recovery period because the plant has not been as severely grazed, so it doesn't have to use as much of the root reserves to get back into its peak growth. What are the nutritional implications for livestock management under high-intensity grazing compared to conventional grazing methods? So this is a really important element because obviously we need to stay in business and in order to stay in business, we need to make sure that our animal performance is taken care of. So the results of conventional grazing practice is that the animals are kind of, they just milling around, they're doing their own thing. There's, there's no grazing pressure put on them. And so the farmers can actually start looking at all sorts of individual animal performance and, and all this sort of thing. But at the end of the day, when we start applying more intensive grazing practice, we got to make sure that our animals are taken care of. And in order to do that, we do what we call a biological plan where we say, okay, this is my map for the year. This is what my animals are going to be doing. This is what their nutritional requirements are. Um, and for goodness sake, do not put highly vulnerable animals into high-intensity grazing practice because you will come unstuck. I can tell you this from personal experience. You can't expect animals to trample the grass, live in very, very high-dense environments, be pregnant, produce milk for their calves or their lambs and give all the things that they need to do. So that's why right at the very beginning I said to you, what we do with holistic plant grazing is we look at what we need to do, our tools of management, and at certain times we use high intensity to do something, at other times we don't. So we have to be very, very careful when we're dealing with the sort of advanced management is that your animal's nutritional needs are taken care of primarily because if you get that wrong, you won't be around in business long enough to see the impact of your work. And how does the timing and frequency of rotations impact the effectiveness of high-intensity grazing in optimizing forage utilization and regrowth? Again, there are two things we need to look at. The one is that in terms of our grazing practice, we have two seasons. We have what we call the open season, which is 
the time at which the grass is growing, or, and when I say grass, I mean all forage. It means that the forage is growing actively as a response to our growing season. And during that time, the open season is what we call it, is we try to manage for plant health. So there we're doing our, make sure our recovery periods are right, we're not damaging any plants, we take care of all that sort of stuff. Then the other side of it is the what we call the closed season, which is from the time that the growth stops to the next regular start. So call it our winter period. And then that time, that's where we start looking at, at trying to prepare the seedbed for the next season, cycle the oxidizing carbon, make sure the animals are, because during that time in the dormant season, most animals are non vulnerable, so you can actually push them quite hard to do some work for you. But there are really four elements that we need to look at when we look at timing and frequency. And, and these are the four things of frequency. So how often do you come back to the same piece of land? There are two things there. The one is in the growing season, it's got a lot to do with the growth rate of the plant because if the plant is regrazed before it has been adequately recovered, overgrazing will result. The second thing is obviously if the animals come back too quickly and the dung and urine that they've concentrated on has not been adequately processed through the ecosystem, you will in fact have animal performance issues because no animals like living on any of the old dung. So then we need to make sure that the consequence of the animals being there in the intensity has been processed through the ecosystem so, so it disappears. The second element on that is timing. So when are you going to do it? And as I mentioned just now, are you going to do it? My opinion is that during the growing season, what we want to do is we want to just trim our grass, making sure that it's staying healthy. We don't want to do anything too dramatic in the growing season. So the timing is the open season, the closed season. Uh, the closed season is nice to process all this because you come to the end of your growing season. Now you know how much grass you've got left till the next the start of the next season. And then you can say, okay, how I'm going to use it. I'm going to graze it in one go. I'm going to take it off in three goes. What what are you going to do? Uh, the third element is the duration. How long are the animals going to stay there? And this is really, really important. It's probably one of the biggest changes that we've seen in using this as one of our tools. Um, if the animals are remaining on a piece of land for a short period of time, they have what we call filing, lots of dung and lots of urine, lots of dust, all sorts of things. And the, the you actually have an enormous amount of wastage in your actual grazing. And, and we've actually we, we found that um, if one moves animals onto fresh grazing more often, your a, your carrying capacity goes skyrocketing and animal performance uh, goes up quite a bit. So uh, the duration that they're on a piece of land is pretty important. Go back to the convention where animals just dotted around the landscape for months and months and months. That is where you actually lose a huge amount of your available grazing. They won't graze where animals have urinated or dunked. And then obviously the fourth one is what we're talking about now is the intensity. At what intensity of animals do you want to get your job done? And there are elements of intensity are what kind of animals are they adapted? Are they vulnerable? The real change, the quantum change happens when animals change their behavior. So kind of they're in each other's personal space. They're not looking where they're walking, they're dunging, they're urinating, they're standing on old material, they're chipping the soil. So that is the really the key element to ecological change. But having said that, it's not every year, all year, every day, all day. It's when you need it specifically to get a certain result. Roland, I'm actually very curious to know, are there any specific strategies or technologies that enhance the effectiveness of high-intensity grazing, such as GPS tracking for livestock movement or soil monitoring for pasture health? One of the advantages, obviously, of having animals in a tight bunch close together is that you don't, it's an overrated technology for this application. The other things which have really made a huge difference is, is um, electric fencing, mobile waters, when you're dealing with animals in this intensity, you need to make sure that your management is right up there at, at, at the very highest level. Um, and so so we've got to be careful that we don't go all the way down this technological track when we actually can do this stuff pretty simply. I mean, I've, we, there are people doing this up in Zimbabwe and Kenya without a single ounce of um, technology. They're just using herding. So so you can do this within, with a herding environment and you can do it with um, any sort of other technology you have. Having said that, though, um, the livestock movement uh, part of your question is so everything here has to be done on a grazing plan. You've got to know what you're doing, why you're doing it. Um, you know, always I quote Alan Savory, he says the right animals, the right place, the right time, for the right reason. Um, and that's very, very important. Um, and in in our uh, holistic management planning, we talk about um, the feedback loop, which is we make a plan uh, and then we assume we're wrong. Uh, which is contrary to human nature. Humans always make a plan and assume they're right. 
So we assume we're wrong and we say to ourselves, if this is our plan and we are wrong, where's the first place we're going to see that we're wrong? So you set up sort of canaries in the coal mine, in the coal mine so that uh, you don't fall off the end of the cliff and then you realize you're wrong. You say, okay, I'm expecting my animals to perform as following. Suddenly we see their weight change or their condition drop. Now we've, there's our canary in the coal mine and we can then monitor our progress, control our plan and replan it. And that goes both for livestock, for your business, your economics, your people. But in terms of your pasture health, you're looking at uh, transition in 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 the in the um, in the landscape to what you want. So remember, this is not nobody can tell you what your landscape must look like. That is entirely within your holistic context, and you will design that and manage towards it. So you will say to yourself, "Okay, I need to. I'm wanting a landscape to look like this." Now you manage towards it, and some of your pasture and soil uh, feedback loops will say to you, "But." We expected the land to be transitions going this way and not that way. Or it's maybe we're getting undesirable species of plant coming in. Then you start saying, okay, well, how do we correct that? Instead of sort of a, a generic um, scientifically based measuring tool, we've got to put this into our own lives and for our own context to decide where we want to go and then manage accordingly. And finally, how do high intensity grazing methods integrate with other land management practices? such as agroforestry or conservation grazing, to achieve broader environmental and economic objectives. I know that you actually mentioned that your approach is very holistic. So it would be very interesting to hear your opinion on, on that specifically. So one of the interesting things about, about you know, I mentioned agroforestry, conservation, and let's even scale it to, to our game parks and, our, and nature reserves. Those environments, those let's call it the environments where human intervention has been removed, are probably the fastest degrading places in any environments we, we, we faced with, in, certainly in Southern Africa. And the role of domestic livestock as a proxy for the big herds of game and various other things that used to keep the ecosystem healthy is massive. And let's just use two examples. If you take agroforestry, one of the big issues in agroforestry is fires. So instead of using chemicals to spray the fire breaks or chemicals or fossil fuels to keep the fire breaks um, open, why don't we just put herds of animals in there to keep that grazing down and short? It's very, very simple. Two things happen. The one is the plants get grazed, so you turn that into meat. The soil stays healthy, so when the water comes, it stays in the soil, and you don't have this runoff, and you don't have a massive dependence on chemicals and this sort of thing, which we don't have any way of predicting the long-term consequences of the use of chemicals. Other yeah, than conservation grazing, well, there's no such thing really as conservation grazing. It has to be planned grazing because you have to work towards a, a very clear outcome. So we are already, in some cases, we're already working in game reserves where we're using domestic livestock under a herded environment to do certain things on land, to cycle that carbon, to build up, to trample the old dead material so that it gets back into the soil, which is where it's only place is useful. Otherwise, it goes back into the sky. So through fire. So I think we're sitting on a cusp of an extremely exciting time. We just have to get the academics and the environmentalists and the politicians to sit around the table and say, guys, what are we trying to achieve as a global perspective for our country? And that has to be, we're in a water scarce country. If we can just improve our water cycle, we will improve our ground cover. We will improve our soil health therefore animal performance, therefore livelihoods, therefore communities. And it, it just goes on from there. It just is so exciting. Thanks so much, Roland Cruen, Managing Director at Healing Wolves. For more on the topic, visit www.foodformsnz.co.za. And that's a wrap. Remember to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. From me, Octavius Pandil, our technical producer, Megan Funder Friend, and the rest of the hashtag Team Foodformsnz. Thanks for listening. Life in South Africa can be a lot. I mean, scroll through Twitter for a minute and tell me I'm wrong. Thank God for South Africans though, right? We're inspiring and even on the bad days, we fight back with a smile. That's why I love Food Form Zanzi so much. They're not ashamed to celebrate the ordinary unsung heroes who work every day to put food on our nation's tables. Go to foodformzanzi.co.za and never miss an inspiring story.